Good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank Amitva and the Howra team for the invite and special privilege uh, of being allowed to speak today. In the next 15 minutes, I will try and cover a complex disease near and dear to my heart um, and training. I was fortunate 20 years ago to do my cardiology fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco with Dr. Frank Hanley, who advanced the surgical management of the disease and changed the outcome and outlooks for these patients. In my career, this lesion has gone from a futile project with many patients having not having any surgical options and choosing palliative care to now all patients at our institution will either undergo a staged or single repair with a very favorable outcome. This is what I'm planning to review today. Simple diagram of tetralogy of flow pulmonary atresia mapcas. This is a large VSD. There's anterior deviation of the conal septum. And then as is the case, the main pulmonary artery is quite hypoplastic and the true pulmonary arteries also can be very diminutive. The hallmark of the disease are the MAPCAs, which is the aeropulmonary collateral vessels arising off either the ascending transverse or descending aorta, feeding multiple lung segments, and may also be dual supplied and feed the native pulmonary arteries. The embryology of this disease, MAPCAs are not true pulmonary arteries. They are intraparenchymal pulmonary vessels that have systemic artery connections. This occurs very early on in embryonic life um, and is true of all fetuses. As the true pulmonary arteries develop and have continuity to the right ventricle, these MAPCAs will normally regress. The error in this process is when the main pulmonary artery becomes a predic, does not connect. Um, this occurs very on, early on, even before septation. So again, the combination of VSD absence of the main pulmonary artery and MAPCAs is the primary problem. The pulmonary circulation is very variable with MAPCAs. Again, we will review there can uh, be native pulmonary arteries. As you see this picture over here on the left, there is the easiest form of pulmonary atresia where there is a VSD, uh, an absence of main pulmonary artery, and the ductus feeds the uh, uh, native pulmonary artery. In our institution, this is uh, typically repaired with a early shunt to augment growth of the pulmonary arteries. And then uh, usually four to six months of age will undergo complete repair with VST closure and an RV to PA conduit. Moving on to uh, the other two, uh, having two types of pulmonary arteries, you can have the native pulmonary arteries typically fed by a ductus with MAPCAS or uh, a more severe form would be MAPCAS alone without any native pulmonary arteries. And these two types are what we're gonna review today. The different disease that we're not reviewing is pulmonary atresia with intact septum. This occurs much later embryologically. There is no VSD. The real problem is the absence of the pulmonary valve. Typically the main pulmonary arteries and branch pulmonary arteries are, are typically um, adequate in size, mildly hypoplastic and fed by a ductus. There is typically confluence of the branch pulmonary arteries and no MAPCAS identified with this disease. Like we all know, this is very variable in its treatment options and outcome to the point of being a very hypoplastic tricuspid valve. You can have coronary uh, dependent circulation uh, and a hypoplastic RV and be in a single ventricle management strategy or there can be a reasonable tricuspid valve, and this can be treated with RF perforation and balloon dilation of the pulmonary valve. Again, pulmonary atresia and tax septum is not the topic of today's conversation. Uh, the epidemiology of MAPCAS, 1% of heart disease. When we look at patients with tetralogy of flow, about 20% of them have pulmonary atresia. Again, the more severe form. A number of these patients, have DeGeorge syndrome quite common with the right aortic arch. They also can have bacterial charge or allergial syndrome. The natural history, of course, depends on the adequacy of the pulmonary blood flow. With significant stenosis in the vessels, we will see a, a cyanosis, and large vessels can have overcirculation. Um, without intervention, there is a high early mortality between 50 to 75% of patients will die within the first year of life without intervention. 
The modes of presentation, like I mentioned, we can have cyanosis present, present in 50%, heart failure in those kids who have pulmonary overcirculation with larger mass. A number of patients also will present in the nursery with a murmur, and this is typically with stenosis, so the MAPCAS will be audible. We have been seeing more and more patients um, now with the recognized fetal diagnosis. All patients in our state receive a screening a level one ultrasound looking for four chambers of the heart and four valves. If they do not identify the pulmonary valve or the uh, OB sonographer recognizes the VSD is referring to us for further evaluation. The typical transthoracic echo is that of tetralogy of flow with a large VSD uh, aortic override. There can be anterior deviation of the septum in the absence of the main pulmonary artery. There will be a either ductus arteriosus feeding the PAs or MAPCAs. And this is the key by the echo imaging or further imaging such as a CT or cardiac cath to define pulmonary blood flow. This is a critical uh, to defining first steps in surgical repair. So this is a fetal echocardiogram recently seen um, in our clinic. Uh, looking at the image to the left, this is uh, further along a 36 week scan. You can see as you watch this play, uh, the, the left ventricle over here on the left side of the screen, there is a single semi-lunar valve uh, overriding with a large VSD. Um, with this single picture, you would not be able to differentiate if this is a truncus versus tetralogy of flow, but additional imaging, we were unable to find a pulmonary valve segment. If you turn your attention to the screen on the right here, same patient, uh, we now see that there is retrograde flow coming towards us anterior um, into uh, confluent branch pulmonary arteries. Again, not uh, uh, looking like a truncus, but more consistent with tet pulmonary atresia. Further images of the same patient. So this is a uh, sagittal image anterior here. The fetus's head is uh, uh, up top to the right of the screen. You can see the transverse aorta here, and there does appear to be retrograde filling of a ductus coming back to the pulmonary arteries. Scanning further down the aorta, again, this is the posterior part or lower descending aorta. This gets also somewhat crowded with color flow, suggesting that there's more than just a ductus, but consistent with MAPCAS. This patient was born this uh, last week, and here is his trans thoracic echo. The findings consistent with tetralogy with a large VSD aortic override. There is an umbilical catheter noted in the left atrium here. And when we scan, we are unable to recognize a main pulmonary artery segment. Just like the fetal imaging, you can see here is a vessel arising off the descending aorta with retrograde filling to confluent pulmonary artery segments. So these are mildly hypoplastic and potentially there's another color signal seen in the uh, posterior space here. Just like the fetal image, this is now an aortic arch image that as we scan through here, we can see what either is a ductus or collateral feeding to the pulmonary artery segments. And then down lower here, we have a descending aortic additional vessel. In our institution, we typically will uh, perform a cardiac CT in addition to a heart cath to further evaluate uh, the, the uh, pulmonary uh, segments. So this again, just zooms in on the absence of any true main pulmonary artery. This is a CT looking uh, uh, anterior to posterior, and we're gonna rotate to the patient's left. And as we get a sagittal image here, we can start to see reasonable pulmonary segments of flow. On the undersurface of the aorta is what appeared to be the PDA, and on here, and then on the undersurface here, we are gonna see uh, what we called the PDA, kept the patient on PGE uh, as a significant amount of pulmonary blood flow was fed through the native pulmonary arteries. So for this patient, we again were concerned uh, that this was ductal fed native pulmonary arteries and our typical intervention would be a early shunt to augment those growth of the main pulmonary, the native pulmonary arteries. Again, the origin of MAPCAS can be from multiple areas, the upper to mid thoracic aorta. There also is uh, uh, 
MAPCAs can arise from subclavian arteries, the abdominal aorta, and not uncommonly can arise directly from the coronary arteries. Here is from Greg Adamson in the Journal of American Heart Association, uh, nice angiogram pictures looking here uh, from the left subclavian artery feeding two segments of lung from a MAPCA. As we frequently see with MAPCAs, they can be somewhat aneurysmal and dilated and then have areas of stenosis. This is an angiogram um, uh, number B here from the lower descending aorta near the diaphragm with multiple torturous vessels giving rise to both the right and left lung segments. This uh, on item C in the upper right is a picture from a coronary artery. Again, very impressive uh, collateral that gives rise to uh, both the right and left lung segments, uh, but also feeds the, the left anterior descending. Here are additional MAPCAs from the mid uh, aorta, additional a dual, fly, dual supply into the main pulmonary artery, sorry, the native pulmonary arteries. So our principles of surgical therapy, we connect as many lung segments as possible uh, to the right ventricle as early as possible. Um, the longer they are uh, in contact with systemic circulation, we tend to see uh, histologic changes of stenosis near the aorta, making the unifocalization procedure more difficult. Uh, again, we will assess if there are native pulmonary arteries and augment flow with either a Melbourne or central shunt for growth of the native pulmonary arteries. And then finally, like I mentioned, the therapeutic catheterization and balloon angioplasty and stent placement is a critical part of evaluation and post-intervention um, management. Earlier is better, like I mentioned, we typically will operate uh, for the goal of complete repair within the first six months of life. The components of the repair, we will walk through the unifocalization diagram. We shunt, as I mentioned, to get either a central or Melbourne shunt to grow the native pulmonary arteries. We, with complete repair, will place a right ventricle to pulmonary artery conduit. And in our institution, we use a cadaver cryopreserved aortic homograph. And then the critical assessment of do we feel this patient is a candidate for VSD closure? This a lot of times is the preoperative assessment of the growth, the, di the size of the pulmonary arteries. And there's lots of different tools um, as far as to assess pulmonary artery size to normal. Um, and in our institution, we will assess pulmonary artery flow um, and a right ventricular pre pressure that is less than three quarters systemic to consider VSD closure. Here's two diagrams showing on the left side of the screen, a modified central shunt, again, to either the main pulmonary artery or near the bifurcation, taking that into the ascending aorta for growth of the native pulmonary arteries. And on the right side here is a Melbourne shunt, again, a central end to side uh, for diminutive pul native pulmonary arteries for growth. The advantages of using a initial RV to PA conduit is it does review, uh, sorry, reduce LV volume overload. Um, it provides pulsatile flow into the pulmonary arteries for growth, and it allows us catheter access for intervention if needed into the branch pulmonary arteries. The disadvantage is this is a high pressure hypoplastic system that has a higher incidence of aneurysm, pseudo aneurysm formation, and pulmonary blood flow is also, if the pulmonary arteries grow, can be overcirculated. The most important diagram again here and what is uh, the longest part of the operation. This is, can be six to 10 hours of, of uh, dissecting of the MAPCAs from the lower descending aorta or the upper aorta. This is critical to recognizing by the CT, the uh, uh, arrangement of the bronchi in relationship to the MAPCAs. As these are removed and pulled up and over, you will anastomose a left-sided vessels over to here, right-sided map is here, using ideally the true pulmonary arteries or sometimes some homograph material to augment the central portion. This then results in an area that will be the um, distal portion of the RV to PA conduit to connect to the unified focalized segments. And Dr. Hanley um, had an interoperative method to assess pulmonary uh, blood flow. 
and after completion of the unifocalization and the distal anastomosis of the RVDPA conduit, he would place a perfusion cannula and a PA catheter inserted into the proximal end with a left atrial vent. The conduit is connected to the bypass machine. The bypass is run at an increasing flow rates to 2.5 liters per minute per meter squared, and the pulmonary artery pressure is monitored. BSD is closed if the mean conduit pressure is less than 25 under this uh, setup, and it is left open to be closed at a later date if the pressures are greater than 25 millimeters of mercury running at a flow rate of 2.5 liters. So here is from the Annals of Thoracic Surgery 2019, uh, uh, a rehab strategy where you have native pulmonary arteries that are adequate, can be a complete repair with RVDP conduit and potential closure without a unifocalization needed. A combined strategy where you need to augment the central shunt uh, to the native pulmonary arteries. Unifocalization of the MAPCAS could be then a second stage, a reassessment of VSD uh, capacity to be open or closed. So multiple stage surgical intervention or a case where the map goes are quite large, we may consider a complete single stage repair, unifocalize the vessels, put the RV to PA conduit, reassess the right ventricle pressure, um, and consideration of VSD closure in one single stage. The outcomes of surgical repair, uh, in to find, finish up here, uh, the early mortality is low, less than 5%. The late mortality is around 16%. The 10-year survival is 86%, the 20-year survival 75%. Again, early intervention to have a better candidate before we have a malnourished, very sick heart uh, has a better outcome. All of these patients will have frequent catheter-based interventions and reoperations for either conduit replacement or catheter-based melody valve um, uh, as they get older. The perioperative complications are listed below. Um, relatively small, but with complex and sick infants with reperfusion inju injury, the need for ECMO support is not uncommon. The conclusions, um, again, I typically uh, in my career started with a very pessimistic approach to this diagnosis when we would have a fetal or an early neonate um, as this being the most severe form of tetralogy of flow. Uh, we now have hope uh, a process to evaluate uh, and treat these patients uh, with the survival that is better than expected. Many of these patients are not restricted as far as activity exercise. They're growing quite well. They typically have elevated right ventricular pressure and are going to be a long-term adult congenital patient that requires very close follow-up. But again, I tend to be more optimistic now with these patients that the success of 20 years is much better than we ever anticipated. Thank you so much for your time uh, for this complicated uh, uh, lesion. Uh, I wish I was there in India with the team. Um, here is a, a nice fall little picture here in Minnesota. And now I'll take some time for questions. Have a good day. Thanks.